after making part one and watching it, I realized that uh, there were some things that in the rush to edit and get the uh, video down to a reasonable size that I had failed to correct uh, a couple of errors. I had omitted some information that I had intended to include and so on. So this is a kind of part 1B uh, and it's intended to be a follow-on to the part 1 of uh, Hi-Fi tube amps. The first thing is when I referred to this uh, article I inadvertently gave the wrong date. I said that it was a 1959 date, but it actually is not. The uh, the date is a 1950 date, as you can tell right there. The uh, September, or I'm sorry, December of 1950. So uh, I hope you'll. Uh, You'll pardon me on that one. The Once again, the article is called Building the Williamson Amplifier. Uh, and the author of this article, Kiros, is actually one of the uh, authors of the uh, ultra-linear article that we'll be discussing in part two. The second thing that I failed to talk about is I mentioned that there were some changes that people made to uh, uh, the characteristics of some of these amplifiers to take care of uh, high frequency oscillation. And one of those things, uh, there were basically two ways to do this, and I mentioned that those occurred, but I didn't uh, talk very much about the specifics. One way is by using a resistor capacitor combination on this direct coupling. Remember this tube is direct coupled to that tube in the Williamson. And by putting a resistor capacitor combination, what in effect you're doing is the grid resistor of this tube is uh, a very high impedance at low frequencies, but as the uh, frequency goes up, this capacitor, uh, the capacity reactance goes down. And so uh, when the, uh, the combination of this capacitor, and they're also in this particular amplifier, the second capacitor off of the plate resistor, uh, those have the effect of causing the high frequency response to tail off. Another way to accomplish the same thing is by placing a capacitor across the feedback resistor. This has the effect of increasing the feedback at high frequencies. And as you may remember, as the feedback increases, the gain of the amplifier goes down. So this network and this network, uh, the capacitors down here, are intended to actually lower the high frequency gain of this amplifier. Now you, you might wonder why someone would do that. Well it turns out that because of, of uh, the fact that at the high frequencies that the new transformers could operate, you could get oscillations in the circuit. And those tended to occur at high frequencies, and one way to eliminate that is by reducing the gain of the amplifier at those high frequencies. So this is an example of that kind of thing. Those were a few of the things that I didn't mention. Finally, one of the things that I never talked about, I, I mentioned that speaker manufacturers were working on better speakers. One of the problems with all speakers is that the impedance of a speaker changes with frequency. And the reason is it's a coil. It's a coil made with wire, so it has both inductance, capacitance, and resistance. It's an RLC circuit. And due to the 
uh, fact that it's not a not a perfect inductor, uh, or or even better, a perfect resistor, its impedance varies with frequency. This is a typical voice coil impedance variation, and the reason that I point that out is because if you look at the ways of obtaining feedback, if, for example, the resistor across which you're obtaining feedback varies with frequency, then the feedback varies with frequency. Well, that was one of the reasons why that designing the transformer was so important. And so you might ask, well, why in the world do you even need the transformer? It seems to be causing all the trouble. And the problem is, if you look at this voice coil impedance, it doesn't actually say this, but normally uh, the voice coil impedance is somewhere between 4 ohms and 16 ohms. Now, you could get a much higher impedance voice coil, but you'd need a lot of turns of wire, and the, uh, the space you have inside a speaker is so small that it would be hard to get a lot of turns of wire in there without producing uh, a lot of tolerance problems. So you tend to have to keep the voice coil impedance fairly low. The output of the amplifier, that is the frequency uh, of the uh, plate resistance of the output stage, is fairly high. And Generally, the tubes used in these amplifiers have plate resistance that can go anywhere from around 2,000 or so up to around 8 or 10,000 ohms. So the reason that you need the transformer is you have to transform the impedance of the, of the plate resistance, essentially, of these tubes down to the low impedance of the voice coil. And the, uh, the transformer, the turns ratio of the transformer, is what causes, for example, a 5,000 ohm plate resistance to be transformed down to a 16 ohm speaker impedance. And so with tubes, because of the high plate resistance, you really don't have any choice but to use a transformer. One of the advantages of solid state is there are circuits, totem poles, and others that I will not get into that allow you to direct couple the output to a low impedance speaker. And that removes all of the problems inherent in these transformers. Not only is the circuit simpler, but it generates less heat. It certainly is a lot lighter, and in general, the output circuits of transistorized or solid-state amplifiers are actually better uh, because they're a better direct match to the speakers. But that's another topic for another day. So uh, I'm sorry that I had to prepare this little uh, miscellaneous add-on or appendix, but I hope it will add to the understanding of part one, and I'm going to call this one part 1b. So look forward for, to part 2 and uh, I hope you enjoyed this video as well.